Let's give ourselves a hand for all the work that you do. Amen. I want to say thank you to all the volunteers that work here and volunteer here and do all what they do. Thank you for all what you do. And also thank you for all of you and what you do outside of here. It's because of you the world exists. Amen. Things happen. I always say to people, the Bible says that the hand cannot say to the foot, we don't need you. Or the eye can't say to the arm, we don't need you. In other words, the hand and the arm and the foot, we all need each other because it forms the body. And no matter what you do in this community or around the world, whatever you do, computer or, or construction or some kind of labor, your work is all part of the body that makes things function. And so I want to say thank you for all what you do here in the communities, wherever else you work. Thank you that you are important, regardless of maybe you feel like you're not or, are, or you do. One way or the other, you are important to the community, to the world, and most of all to God. Thank you for that. Amen? Amen. I'd like to pick off to where I left off last week. I'm going to pick up next week. I've been in a series about which way, and I was kind of caught between the middle about what to preach, okay? And I didn't know if I was supposed to preach a Labor Day message or if I was going to preach a, uh, you know, my sermon, you know, what I was going to do because I thought Labor Day, well, obviously you guys all proved me wrong. The first service we were packed out, and I, it, you guys proved me wrong. I thought maybe because it's Labor Day that people wouldn't show up. And so, Harley, thank you for being here and all that here because you proved me wrong. But I, so I was saying, I'm going to put my which way sermon on the hold until next week, and I'll pick that back up because it's very crucial where we're going next week. Very, very important, and I didn't want anyone to miss that. So today, I want to be speaking about Labor Day. Labor Day, the day of rest. And maybe you can relate to this. Labor Day, American's day of rest. Some of you know that's really something. I don't know about you, but... It seems to be whenever you're given Labor Day, you pack this weekend in with more things than you normally do because you know you got Monday, right? I don't know about you. Like I said, we got 30-some people at our house or our cabin right now, and it's fun. We got all these little ones. It's great to see all these new generations coming up, right? And, I mean, they're running all over the place. Our house is loud, but I like it because it has life. And when they go home, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? Right? Amen? But also Labor Day is the last big weekend before school really sets in. Moms and dads are saying, thank you, Jesus, amen, my kid, my daughter, and whatever, they're going off to school. I finally get some me time, right? But it's the last big day before school really sets in, really sets in. Another one is this. Labor Day is the shift from summer to fall and fall to winter. Amen? I don't know about you. My son lives in Arizona, and he has one season, hot, 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 right? And he looked up the temperature yesterday when we were out on four-wheeling. He looked up the temperature, and it was 102 degrees there in Chandler, Arizona. I said, thank you, Jesus. And I said, Rick, do you miss it? He said, no, I like it. I said, but yeah, but look at your skin. It's getting old. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but it's hot. We get the four seasons, right? It's a, another Labor Day is a day given to rest recharge and refresh our batteries. That's what Labor Day is supposed to be all about, that we get a chance to walk away from our busyness of life or busyness of our schedules, our work, and get a chance to refresh and revive and get, and, uh, get our batteries charged. But also, there's a day that God has given to us. And if you have your notes, the, the word Labor Day is, or Sabbath Day is this, a day to rest with God, that God has given us a Sabbath day, a day to rest with God. That, God, I want to rest in you. God said, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give you rest. God's desire for your life is to rest in him. And when you find rest in him, you find strength in him, you find peace in him, you find comfort in the Lord. But in Exodus chapter 20, it talks there that Jesus is talking about the Sabbath day. And I love how God puts that there. He talks about how he created the heavens and the earth, and after, this, after he created the heavens and the earth, on the seventh day, he rested. And right after he did that, he goes into business again, and he starts writing the Ten Commandments. God is always up to something. I always say this, when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. God is always doing something. Even when you feel like he's not doing something, God is always up to something. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. And always remember that. Right after he got done resting, he starts pinning the Ten Commandments. But look at what he says, starting with verse 8. He says this. He says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. In other words, 
taking a day out of your busy schedule of life and remembering it by keeping it holy. How do you keep the Sabbath day holy? The Sabbath day is holy, the first and foremost, when you come into this place, every day, every Sunday when we come to worship, whether it be on Wednesday nights now with small groups or Miracle Sunday, whatever, you come first and foremost that, God, I come and I surrender that which may be hindering me in my life. That, God, I give you what's the struggle, the battle, maybe the hidden sins in my life. I give them to you. And here's the cool thing about doing that. Only God knows what you give him. Only God knows. The person to the right or to the left of you, they don't maybe know what you're going through in life. But all you have to do is pray under your breath that, God, I'm struggling with this right now in my life. And this is the day of holiness, the day of Sabbath. And, God, I'm supposed to come and rest. You ever think about that? When you think of rest, you think about being in your bed 12 hours, being able to watch TV, man, to have somebody feed you grapes or whatever the case may be, and just chilling, right? But he's talking about resting in your mind, body, soul, and spirit. That God comes to give you rest. So that you, when you come into the place of just to worship God, you can just come and say, God, I come and give you rest. Just to rest in you. To rest in my mind of the weariness of my mind. To rest, God, in the situation that I'm going through in my life. God, to rest maybe in the things that I shouldn't be doing. That, God, I just surrender them over to you. And the moment you do that, the moment you do that in your life, guess what that does? That unlocks God's presence, and in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. And when it unlocks God's presence, guess what happens? The holiness falls. The Bible says in Isaiah, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The reason why that happened, because they set an atmosphere. They set a precedence for God to come. And when you come on a Sabbath day, every Sunday, you can come and make this place holy by surrendering the confusion, the worry, the fear, the doubt in your life, and casting it upon God's feet. And then when you do that, what you hold on to is all you're going to have. But what you let go of, God can take and use and fill and refresh you. And so what happens is when you do that, God takes your scars and turns them into stars. God, I come, and you're going to make this place holy. That's, about, that's what I love about it. I can come. And then he goes on to verse 8. He says, six days you shall labor. And do all your work. In other words, Monday through Saturday, I'm going to labor. I'm going to do all what is required of me. And don't do it just halfway. I'm going to tell you, whatever you're committed to doing something, go the extra mile. Because Deborah was blessed when she went the extra mile. Deborah, when she saw the camels coming, when she saw the camels coming, and man, what she do? She just not just give the, the camels of water. She gave every camel 30 gallons of water because that's what camels drink, 30 gallons of water. And she gave every one, it said 12 camels. Can you imagine 12 times 30? She gave every one of those cam camels 30 gallons of water. She could have just gave them enough till they were satisfied, but she went the extra mile. And because she went the extra mile, guess what happened to her? She was blessed in her life. Blessings come when you go the extra mile. When you go the extra mile Monday through Saturday, maybe on your job, when you're going the extra mile, guess what that does? It sets you up for promotion. It sets you up for blessings. Going the extra mile, not just doing enough to say I'm going to the buy and buy. I'm just going to get do enough to get by. But you get promoted by going the extra mile. That man, Monday through Saturday, I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm going to get my wages because what I'm working for, I deserve it. And not only do I deserve it, but I'm going to show them that I'm going to work hard for my labor. I'm going to work hard because I'm going to recognize that I'm going to be a servant of God and I'm going to honor God by showing my employer that I'm going to work hard. You know, I read a statistic, a true statistic. I read a statistic that the average American, even though we work 40 hours a week, they say that the really the average American works only 28 hours a week. You know what they're doing? The rest of the 12 hours they're playing at work. Could you imagine if we were more productive in our hours? And so what he's saying is when you work those six days, do the best of you can. Make your employers proud of you. Make them proud of you because that's when you set yourself up for promotion. Right? If you want to be mediocre, then you do things mediocre. If you want to be average, then you do things average. But if you want to excel, you do it the best you can. 
But then he goes on to say, watch this, verse 10. But the seventh, the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male, nor female servants, nor your, even your animals, nor foreigners residing in your towns. In other words, make it a priority. What you feed is what's going to grow. And what you prioritize is what's going to always be on the forefront. And what happens with church is that we take sometimes church or the gathering of the saints, we sometimes take that in a mediocre way. Well, I feel like going to church today. Well, I don't feel like going to church today. And we take church or Christ out of the equation, the day of Sabbath where God wants to refresh you, bless you, and meet you right where you're at. And what happens, we, we take that and we make it a least priority. And what he's saying is on the seventh day, make it a priority that you visit, man, and get with God. And that you make the, you know, a Saturday or Sunday, which is our day of Sabbath, an opportunity or priority in my life that, God, I'm going to be with you on Sunday. This is my day of worship, and I'm not letting anything or anybody steal it from me. Right? You have to make it a priority. You know, uh, right now we have, like I said, 30-some people at our house. But I have six sisters and a brother. My little sister went on to be with the Lord. So now I have five actual living sisters and my brother. And you know what? Out of my six sisters and five sisters and my brother that I left, it's only my brother that is there. All my other five sisters aren't there. But only my brother, my natural sibling, is there. And yet I got my nieces, my nephews, and their kids, and so on and so forth. But my family, my other five sisters, Rhonda, Gail, Lana, Marlis, and Janie, are not there. And because they're not there, guess what happens? That's not complete. And the family reunion is not a full family reunion because all my sisters are not there. My mom and dad are already in heaven, and I'm going to be there with them someday. But here physically on earth, it's not the same because all the others are not there. And what happens with you, even though you may at times feel like you're a number, maybe you feel like you're just a seat warmer, you are important to Adventure Church that when you are gone, the family is not complete. But here's what happens. When you're gone, God feels absence because, listen, he doesn't see Stephanie. He doesn't see Jamie. He doesn't see you because you are not here worshiping him. And he's a jealous God and he wants any, none of us to perish. He wants us all to be in fellowship with him so that he can meet you right where you're at and refresh you and strengthen you throughout the day. So my point to you is make the day of Sabbath or Sunday a priority. In verse 11, he goes on to say, For the sixth day the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God saw the need to rest, to come and dine, to rest in his presence, to be still and know that he is God in your life. I was saying this in the first service. Cheryl and I, when we lived in Grand Junction, Colorado, Grand Junction is an illiterate state, I kid you not, or town. They don't have street names. They have street alphabets. They run from A to Z. No kidding. Every street in Grand Junction is either a letter or, or, or an alphabet. So our street was F and a half row. So if you lived in Grand Junction, that's no kidding. And then it went from F and a half row to F and three quarters or F and one third. That's no kidding. That's how you find Grand Junction. I don't think people know how to read there. There's no kidding. It's crazy. So we lived on F and a half row. And we, uh, <laughs> can you imagine that? We flunked the test, F road, amen. And then so, but you lived on, uh, Michael, you lived on D road, and Andy lived on A road, and Quinn lived on B, and that's how it was, no kidding. And, and, and F and a half road was, F and a half road, it was at 27th Street and F and a half road. 27 represented 27 miles from the border of Utah. So everything bordered on F and a half or 27, it was all from borders. It was crazy. But anyways, where we lived at, it was kind of out in the country. And our normal routine every morning in life was that we get up every morning, and I, I live 25 minutes from our church where I was pastoring at. And so, obviously, we jump in the car, and we take off and take things for granted and get from point A to point B real fast because we drove our car. But then my wife started taking on biking. We started riding bikes. 
And I, we start riding bikes down F and a half road. And we started to realize that, man, as we slowed down in life, man, it was cool because all of a sudden we saw things that we didn't see before when we were in our car. Because we were just zipping by 55 miles an hour. You can't see things. But when we started getting on our bikes, man, we, I didn't know there was a river that ran right along the shoulder of that road that we were traveling on. There was a little creek that was right there. I didn't know that. I didn't know that there, there was even cows in the field back there because they were like a blur when I was going by. So I learned as I started slowing down. But then we took up walking. And as we took up walking, I mean to tell you, it was amazing. All of a sudden, we started seeing these things that we never saw before. Matter of fact, I was telling them in the first service, and I was telling Scott and Lisa that it was, when we started walking, I came upon these, these tools. It was so cool. Man, I found a, a, a vice grip. I found a screwdriver. I found a crescent wrench. I thought, man, I'm going to keep walking. <laughs> I'm going to fill my treasure chest. I'm going to get my toolbox full without paying for them. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but I started to see the more I slowed down, the more I started to see in life. And the more I started to see in life, I was starting to enjoy life better. And what God is saying, that you need to take a Sabbath day and slow life down and enjoy the moment, enjoy the season that you are in. So many times we are jumping from one season to the next season, from one thing to the next thing, and we're never enjoying or seizing the moment in which God wants to do in your life. And the reason why God created Sabbath day was for you to seize the moment in his presence. In his presence to enjoy his company, to enjoy who he is, his character, his love, his acceptance of who he is for you. But so many times we never be able to experience the fullness that God has for our life because we're like Speedy Gonzalez. And we're gone. And God said, just be still and know that I am God. My, my nieces are here. They weren't in the first service, so I didn't share this story, but I will now because they're here. My, Paula, are you here? Paula, stand. This is Paula. And her dad is the one that led me to the Lord when I was an alcoholic, drug addict. It was her dad right there. Her dad led me to the Lord. Amen. Her dad led me to the Lord. You can sit down, Paula. But her dad led me to the Lord. And when I gave my life to the Lord, I was going through withdrawals. And my sister, which I now was kicked out of my home when I was a junior in high school, I lived with my sister Marlis. And my sister Janie, now check this out. I was going through, Pat, these situations in my life, through the withdrawals and everything. And this is what God is talking about, slowing down. I was laying there in my water bed. At the time, water beds were popular. How many of you know, right? <laughs> you got messed up back like me, right, right? You thought they were cool, right? But now my back's all messed up. And I'll never forget. In my withdrawals, God had me in a place of being still. And I'll never forget. I'll never forget when I was laying there in that bed and my sister Marla's at the feet of my bed praying for me 24-7 basically. And I was going through this. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power. And his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on his face. For surely God's presence is in this place. He positioned me in a place to receive. And when I shut off the busyness of this world... God visited me in this bed that I thought the waves of this waterbed were because of me moving, but they were the waves of the Spirit transforming and changing my life as I went through T-shirt after T-shirt, sweating out the garbage in my life. Surely, God's presence is in this place. And when you take time to visit God right where you're at, God will meet you in your situation of life. 
if you would take this time to have a Sabbath day with God. I love this. We have taken the Sabbath day and called it Sunday, a day of worship and rest with him. Sunday, our Sabbath day, is to honor and thank God for helping us through the week. I love it when Jesus says, Paul, Corinthians, he said, God, in my weakness, Lord, you're made strong. Weak when I kneel. Weak when I kneel, God, I can't handle the cares of this world. I'm too fragile. I'm going under. I'm never going to make it. I'm doomed. But powerful when I rise. Because greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, that when I rise, man, God fills me up and energizes me because I took time with a Sabbath day with God to let him bless me, touch me, and to encourage me. What is your Sabbath day with God? Is your Sabbath day a quick fix? Or do you let God touch you? Right where you're at. In Matthew 28, 11, verse 28, he says this, come to me. Now, I always say this, with every action, that's you, you got to come. You got to come. With every action, there's a reaction. I was saying this in the first service, my grandson, Miles, we call him Bone Man. I kid you not. Man, he's nine years old, eight years old. Man, I always told him, I said, Miles, you turn sideways, stick out your tongue, you look like a zipper. <laughs> He's just a skinny little old bean pole. But we were on Branson, and he wanted to learn how to skip rocks because all the other kids could skip rocks. So I was text, I said, take this smooth rock, Miles. And he threw the first one and plunk. And he do it again, plunk. Finally, he got it down. And before you know it, man, he took that rock and And of all people, he skipped it six times. And he got, oh, papa, papa, papa. He got all excited. But you know what that rock did? Every time it skipped across the water, it left a ripple. And it's the same thing with you. You come to God, and God will bring the ripple. You draw near to Jesus, that's your action for him. He will draw near to you, the reaction. The reaction to your action step, God will meet you where you're at. He said, come near to God. You, put your name there because it's in my Bible. I put CJ, who are weary. Are you feeling weary, tired, down, discouraged, defeated, right, and burdened? Maybe you feel like you got the whole world on your shoulders right now. Maybe the pressures of finances, maybe the pressures of home life, whatever it may be in your life right now. What is your burden? He said, come and I will give you rest. In other words, God will take and alleviate that pressure in your life, but you have to come to God. You have to make God your priority in your life, that God, my Sabbath day is coming to you and finding rest. But then he goes on to say this. Watch this in verse 28, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Can you imagine that? Verse 28 and verse 29, God is talking about rest. He understands that either we're going to burn out or we're going to wear out. That's what's going to happen in our lives. Either you're going to burn out or you're going to wear out. So you got to find rest in God. God says, you come and you'll find rest in me. Find rest for your soul. When I was pastoring in Watertown, South Dakota, I was a youth pastor at the time, and we went to Ray Hendricks' house, and he had these two big Clydesdales. Man, they were beautiful horses. And they were pulling us on the hay wagon. And I'm not kidding you, man. It was unbelievable. And the kids started stuffing, you know, get the youth pastor, get the youth pastor. So they stuffed me. I looked like the scarecrow on the Wizard of Oz, right? Man, I had it all, all over me. I was itching like crazy. Finally, I had enough, and I jumped to the front seat where Ray was sitting driving the horses. Once I got in the seat and I was scratching like crazy, felt like I had a bunch of ticks on me, right? And all of a sudden, I said, Ray, why is this horse on the left sweating like crazy? Why is this horse sweating? He said, because, and, and I said, and the horse on the left is not sweating. I said, why is the horse on the right and the horse on the left not sweating? What's going on? He said, watch this. He took the reins in his hand, and he snapped it on the horse on the left. And eventually, that horse caught up with the horse on the right. And before you knew it, man, that horse on the left now was sweating like the horse on the right. So I said to Ray, I said, Ray, what happened? Why did that horse on the right sweat more than the horse on the left? He said, because he learned the secret. The secret, he was 
He's going to pull back on his gait a little bit, and he's going to pull back and become a little slower, take the, the weight or the burden off him, or the yoke off him, and make the horse on the right work. That horse was smart enough, and he backed off. So he was like, hey, oh, happy day <laughs> when Jesus washed. He washed my sin. You don't know that, right? Oh, happy day. And all of a sudden, and that horse joined forces with the horse on the right. And when he did, all of a sudden, the wagon just jerked. And the kids, ah! <laughs> it's because what happened was two are better than one. Pity the man who doesn't have a friend to pick him up when he falls. And what happened was, all of a sudden, that horse joined forces with the horse on the right. And the power became stronger, and the, and the wagon went faster. It's the same way with God, James. That Jesus joins forces with you. He joins forces. He says, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is light. And the reason why he says that, because when you're feeling overcome and you're feeling burdened in your life, he says, man, snap the reins and I'll come and I'll help you in your time of need. And I'll join in with you. I'll get sweaty with you. I'll get dirty with you. I'll get stinky with you. I'll fight the battle with you. Why? Because God will never let the righteous be forsaken, nor will he ever lead you nor forsake you. And God said, the battle is mine and not yours if you let me in. Amen? Amen. So he said, let me come. But then he goes on to say, verse 30, take my yoke, it is easy, and my burden is light. In other words, he said, hey, when I was pastoring at Discover Church, we made these, these pins, these uh, pins, and we had, we had a pin maker, and we made these pins with yellow, and I still got one on my refrigerator because we made some with magnets. And it said, this is God speaking. He said, cast all your cares upon me and have a good day. We put them, man, all our people in the, in the church of Discover, we made, I don't know how many, 1,200 and some pins, I think it was. And this is God speaking. Cast all your cares upon me and have a good day. In other words, I got this. And that's what he says to you. Sometimes you need to wear a pin to remind yourself that this burden that you're carrying is not yours as God if you let him in. But I love this. You say, well, Pastor, how do I come? You ever wondered how you come to God? People sometimes come to God with fear. And the reason why they come to God in fear, because you take your natural relationship with your father or your mother, maybe it wasn't good. Maybe you didn't have a good relationship with your father or your mother. And so because of that, you come with fear and timidity. Because, man, my natural father, my natural mom treated me this. What's my heavenly father going to be? So you come to God in fear. Maybe you come with God with, with a, a tendency of saying, well, I'll believe it when I see it. So how do you come to God? Number one, how do you come to God is this. You come humbled. God, I come humbled. I humble myself in the sight of the Lord. Go ahead and put that up there. I humble myself in the sight of the Lord. James 4.10. And he will lift you up. So, God, I don't come full. I come empty. I come humble before you, God. I don't come like, God, I have it all together. You got it all together, that's when you don't have it all together. When you think you have it all together, you're not inviting God in because you're saying, I got this, God. I can do this on my own. But humble means, God, I come humble. I come broken and open, Lord God, before you. I humble myself before you. And then James 4.10, he will lift you up. Then the second way you come to God, you come open. God, I'm coming open. And listen to what I hear when I say this. I come open for correction. Rebuke, direction, protection in my life. Sometimes we're afraid to become open because we don't maybe like what we're going to hear. But God disciplines us as he does his child because he wants what's best for us. And if you come with open heart, God, open mind, God, I come open. God, I, I just come open. Whatever you have for my life to obey is better than the sacrifice of God. I'm coming open, Lord God, to receive and to hear whatever you have for me in my life. I come open. Then I love this part. Come expecting. Matthew, uh, Psalms 5, verse 1 through 3. Early in the morning I lay my request before the Lord, and I wait in expectation. Can I ask you this? Why do you go to God if you don't believe for miracles to happen in your life? We serve a miracle-working God. And therefore, because I serve a miracle-working God, I can expect miracles in my life. 
But some of you are not expecting anymore because maybe you've been let down. Maybe your expectations were let down. Maybe your things the way you thought it was going to happen didn't happen the way they happened. And so, therefore, you got discouraged and you quit. And you lost your expectancy in God. Well, if it happens, it happens. So be it. Well, you asked for it, you got it. Toyota. Your life will follow your thoughts. The man would have speaks, so it shall be. You either eat fruit, you eat life or death. Those are the words. So a lot of you wonder why you're not expecting or seeing things in your life because you're speaking death over your miracle. God, I come expecting. Because God, I serve a God who is able to do all things. Man, I get excited. How many get excited for Christmas? Man, you told your husband what to get you, and so he better have got you that. And so when it's under the tree, man, you expect it because my man loves me. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? You come expecting. That's mine right there. I mean, when you were little kids, you'd always look at the biggest box, and you'd see if your name was on there, right? You know what my, my wife does? Because my kids used to do that all the time. My grandkids do that. So she always does the seven dwarfs. And the, and, and the reindeers of uh, Rudolph. And so what she does is that maybe uh, my son Rick's here. My son Rick, maybe he's, he's, he's grumpy. So he'll put grumpy on it, but he won't know it's grumpy. So she'll, they'll never know what gifts is theirs until they start passing them out. Oh, that's grumpy. That's, that's uh, Rudolph, whatever. That's Prancer. That's Dancer. Man, why am I Prancer? <laughs> but when you go to God, you come expecting. But here's what happens. When you come humbled, Open, expecting. Now look at this. God meets you where you're at. Now get this. Now you got to get this. I know you don't have your notes, so maybe you can take a picture of it. Watch this. You come to God needy, needy. Come ask. Come and ask. You have not because you ask not. So, God, I'm, I'm coming to you needy. I have a situation in my life, God. I'm needy. Another one, you... Come to God seeking. God, I come seeking, seeking while you may be found. Call it on your name while you're, na while you're here. God, I'm seeking you out. I'm going to seek you out, God. Where you lead me, I will follow. I'm going to seek you out in my life, God. Have you ever played the game hide and go seek? Sometimes it's not easy finding the one you're seeking for, right? It's the same way with God. You got to be determined, God. I'm going to seek you. And when I seek you, I'm going to find you. I'm not going to quit in the middle of the stream. I'm going to seek you out, God. I'm going to come after you with all my heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit, regardless of how long it's going to take, God. I'm going to seek you out. Stop playing. Ellie, Ellie, up, come free. That's the easy way out. You're going to seek them until you find them. You don't have to yell, Ellie, Ellie, up, come free. You seek them out. Another one is this, come thirsty. Come thirsty and drink. You ever think about that, come thirsty and drink? A lot of times we as Christians think of the natural water, right? But God's not saying that. He's talking about maybe your spirit man. You see, you have the natural physical man. That's the outer shell that you see right now, this tent that the spirit man lives in. And what happens, you take care of your physical man. Man, I'll tell you one thing, man. I've been eating so many things. My, my niece, man, she brought me these old Henry bars. I'm telling you, man, two pans of those bad boys. Aaron, his mom, that's a tradition. She makes those peanut butter bars with the chocolate on top. Those bad boys call my name every time. And every time I have calories, calories, sin, sin. But I love it, love it, love it, love it. <laughs> Can I ask you something? Why is it all the good stuff is the bad stuff? You know, what's up with that, right? And I mean to tell you, I, hey, but we think about the natural man of taking care of this temple. But a lot of times what God is saying here, if you're thirsty, he's talking about your spirit man. He's talking about your spirit man. Some of you are disconnected with God. And you're dry and you're empty and you're feeling discouraged. And your relationship is dry and dead. And your relationship is just going mundane and routine of life. And you're not sensing his presence, his love, his acceptance, his forgiveness, and most of all, his strength and his intimacy in your life. That's what he's referring to. When you are thirsty in your spirit, man, the connection with God, come and drink. Jesus, under the representation of the Holy Spirit, is water, wine, dove, fire. He said, come, thirsty. And I'll fill you up. 
Jesus wants your relationship with him to be on fire. So he said, come thirsty. You know, I like this one. Hurt, come and heal. Maybe you hurt. You need to come and heal. But you ever think about that? When you think about hurt, once again, you think about maybe a broken arm, maybe cancer, this, that, and the other thing. But God's not talking about that. God is talking about you as emotional. Do you know that God deals with your emotions? Do you know that God deals with your soul? He deals with your feelings. He deals with that. So maybe some of you are hurting emotionally. Maybe somebody did something to you and hurt you emotionally and scarred you. And you're carrying on to this, and you're a sway back donkey right now. And you're carrying on to this hurt, and you say, I got a right to be hurt because he or she did that. Well, carry the baggage. Walk around going, he all, he all, because God says, you can cast it at me. And God wants to take your scars and turn them into stars. He wants to take your mess and give you a message. He wants to take your stumbling blocks and give you a stepping stones. He wants to take your test and give you a testimony. And in your life what happens is, listen, God says, listen, come who are hurting emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically. Come and I will heal you. You see, I always say this. God is an inside job. God does an inside job. He heals the inside before he heals the outside. He heals your heart and your relationship with him. He heals your spiritual walk with him. That's why I always say, man, when God says we take communion, we're going to do that next week for some of you that came and thought we were going to do communion. I apologize. We always do communion on Miracle Sunday. So we'll get back on track in October, the first week. We'll get back on track. But Miracle Sunday is just coming next Sunday, and that's why we do uh, communion because it sets us up for the miracle. But then it says, listen, come, those who are thirsty, and I will heal you. But then he says, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body, Noah. This is my body. But you know what he says in 1 Peter 2, verse 24? His body that he bore for you says, by his stripes, you are healed. Physically, emotionally. Spiritually. Another one. Weary. Come who are weary, and I will give you rest. Jesus knew the pressure, struggles, and stress that we would go through, so he created a place to rest in him. We go on vacation to find rest. We go to a spa to relax. We go to the gym to get strong. We go for a walk so we can talk. Amen. Jesus is all the above. Sunday is our Sabbath day of rest, worship, and engagement with God, without with engagement with our power source. Without him, the lights go out. Jesus is your alternator. He replenishes your battery. I don't see the alternator putting power in the battery, but I do know when I turn the key, it's there, and it turns over my car. You see, some of you are getting beat up by the enemy. When Jesus was faced, if Paul I know, Jesus I know, when he was faced by the devil, face to face, when he was faced by the devil, he said, Jesus, Michael, I know. Paul, I know. But Tamara, who are you? And you know what he did? The one without the power, he beat that person up. He ripped their clothes off. He destroyed them and they ran away naked because they were powerless, because they were detached from the power source. And what happens in our life, we are walking around lame Christians because we're detached from the power source. Jesus I know. Paul I know. But who are you? Who are you? I'm going to jump right off my notes real quick. I'm going to go somewhere else because I'm going to close. There was this king. His name was Alexander the Great. Many of you probably read him if you're history buffs. True story. One day Alexander the Great was faced with opposition and had to take his army to go out for war. And one of the soldiers thought, no. I can't do that. 
I can't lose my life. I got family. I got this. I got that. And he ran off. And Alexander and his army went off to battle. And when they fought this battle, they won the war and they came back. True story. My friend from Subway. True story. Alexander said, go and get that young man who left the ranks. Find him. So they searched high and low for this young man. Finally, they found this young man hiding. And they brought him to the feet of Alexander. And Alexander is sitting on his throne. They threw this young man at the feet of Alexander. And he laid on the ground. True story. Alexander the Great said, Sir, what is your name? The young man lifted up his head. And he said, My name is Alexandria, sir. Alexandria jumped to his feet. He said, Young man, what is your name? The young man jumped to his feet. He looked Alexander the Great in the eye and he said, My name is Alexandria, sir. Alexandria walked down off the steps, got face to face with a young man. He said, Young man, what is your name? Face to face, the young man said, my name is Alexandria, sir. Alexander the Great looked at this young man and said, young man, either you change your name or you change your conduct. And if you say that you are a believer in Christ and you say that you love God with all your heart, Either you change your name or you change your conduct. That God, I, you are for me. You're not against me. I'm going to seek you while I may find you. I'm going to call upon your name. I'm going to set aside a Sabbath day with you so I can rest and dine at your table and know that, God, you are in control. You see, listen. We need to take time with God. And if you don't take time with God, you're going to be beat up by the cares of this world. And then when you're beat up, the first thing we want to do is we want to blame God when God never had any part of the equation because you never brought him in. Never brought him in. You see, many believers are spiritually bankrupt because they over withdraw from making with, with deposits. Deposits come when you take time, make time, and seek time to come to him. A day of rest is positioning yourself to hear receive and believe in his promises and his word. If you don't take time, you will miss his blessings, forfeit his guidance, and lose your way. Thy word is a lamp, God, unto my feet. You know my comings and my goings. You know my ins and my outs. Rest in God. You see this? In Matthew 6, you don't have to turn it there, but in Matthew 6, but you can see it. Go ahead, turn it there. It says, go into your secret place. Secret place is positioning yourself. Position yourself. That God can meet you right where you're at. Got to get this. Got to get this. You got to get this. This is where many Christians fall off the wagon. They got their J.C. Penney catalog or their Coles catalog, and they man, all these wishes. And they present them before God, and if God don't meet these demands, you give up and you lose your expectations of God. God doesn't give you your wishes. He gives you your desires. And here's what God does. If God gave you the whole banana, you'd be a bunch of spoiled baby Christians. But God gives us what we need at that moment, at that time. So if you have, man, you're going through situations in your life, and you're seeking wisdom, guess what God's going to give you? He's going to give you, Tony, wisdom. Maybe you need strength in your life. He's going to give you strength. Maybe you need, man, encouragement in your life. He's going to give you joy. He gives you what you need because God is not a wasteful God. That's why he gathered the 12 baskets and the tooth and the fish. He gathered all that leftovers because God doesn't waste. Only God gives you what you need at that time. So he said, go into your secret place, Matt. Go into your secret place. 
And that which is done in secret, God will begin to reward. God pours in. He pours in. Oh, God. More of you and less of me. I die. You live. I surrender. You pick up. That's what it's all about. Prayer allows you to pray the answers, not the problems. Prayer is free with no strings attached. All you must do is show up, and he'll do the rest. Today we celebrate Labor Day as Americans, but as believers, we have Labor Day every day with Jesus. Will you stand with me this morning? I want to just take a moment this morning. Let God just touch you right where you're at. Why is it, can I ask you a question? Why is it that when things get quiet, our first reaction is we say something must be wrong? It's quiet. And because it's not a lot of commotion, a lot of noise, our kids aren't running around, they're not screaming, something must be wrong. And we do that with God. But God is the opposite. It's not in the noise where God moves. It's in the quietness. It's in the stillness of his presence. That's why he says, be still and know that I am God. It's in the stillness where God whispers. He doesn't yell. He whispers, it's okay. It's okay. Everything's going to be all right. You're going to cross the finish line. You're going to make it. That's what God does. So here's how I want to end. I want to pray over you this morning. This is your Sabbath day to receive. If you believe, if you believe, sir, you shall, you shall. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. You shall receive whatever you ask in prayer. What are you asking for today? What are you believing for today? Let God meet you where you're at. We're going to close with it as well. Pastor Andrew, bring us out. Come on, let's believe. It is well with my soul.
we thank you for this time we can come together and just focus on you, Jesus. This time where we can hear from you. And we thank you that you are good. We thank you for loving us, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We take rest in you. In your name, everyone said, Amen, amen. Can we just give God some praise this morning? Come on. Amen. Amen. God is good. Hey, thank you guys so much for being here this morning. Uh, we are so glad you guys are here. And uh, we'll see you next week at uh, 9 or 1045. And make sure you buy some church merch out there at our pop-up shop. Get some church merch. All right. Have a good week, guys. We would like to thank you for joining us for service this week. Adventure Church is a tool within God's toolbox that he is using to further his kingdom. If you have been blessed by this ministry, please consider giving. Your generous donation will ensure we're able to continue to provide these online services many people have come to rely on. You can find a safe and easy giving link within the description of this video or one of these three options you see here. Thank you in advance for your generous donation.